Welcome to Space Station Live, a special report from TUTV, Temple University Television, produced in association with NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. I'm Nick Lucier. And I'm Karina Chung. Let's go live to the Destiny Lab module of the International Space Station, which is orbiting about 260 miles over the Indian Ocean just south of Australia at about 17,100 miles per hour to speak with three of the crew members serving on Expedition 38. We are honored to speak with American astronauts Rick Mastricchio and Mike Hopkins and from Japan, astronaut Koichi Wakata. How are you, gentlemen? Yeah, we're doing great. Welcome to the International Space Station. Great, thank you. So here is our first question. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Mark Halberstadt, and uh, this is a question for uh, Rick. What is one skill that you didn't think that you would be using on the space, on the, uh, space station, but once on board has proven to be valuable? Well, since I had been here several times to the International Space Station, I kind of knew what to expect. But I tell you, one of the things I'm doing a lot more of than I do normally on the ground is a lot, of, a lot more cleaning and vacuuming and things like that. <laughs> it's, it's definitely a useful skill to have up there because, you know, we have to maintain the space station ourselves. Nobody up, comes up here and cleans for us. Nobody comes up here and vacuums and wipes the walls. <laughs> so it's uh, no matter where you go, you still got to do the basic things like that. Uh, I guess this question's for Mike. Uh, what is one mistake which was made, and how long did it take to correct on the space station? How long would it have taken to fix the problem had the problem occurred on Earth? Okay, uh, you know, mistakes. I guess we make mistakes every day just in the execution of our, our duties up here when we're running uh, procedures and stuff. But very fo fortunately, uh, we have a team on the ground that's, that's watching over our shoulder, that's following along with us. And more often than not, they catch the mistakes uh, really before they have a chance to, to develop into anything. And, and so um, I am happy to say there hasn't been any real major mistakes that, that have been made on procedures up here. But uh, there's been little mistakes. But again, the ground has, has caught us and helped us out. And in terms of failures, of course, we had a big failure last December with one of the cooling systems outside, and and uh, that took uh, three weeks before we were able to get it fixed by planning and executing a couple of spacewalks. So on the ground, that certainly would have been uh, quite a bit easier, and I suspect we would have had it fixed uh, within a few days. Hi, my name is Zach. Uh, this question is for Koichi. What is your favorite experiment and why? Yeah, first of all, I uh, enjoy working on all the science activities on board the space station. Especially, I really enjoy working on hands-on type experiments. We have a variety of experiments, but some of the ex examples are like uh, a SPHERES experiment, uh, that is for the development of algorithm of the multi-spacecraft and robotics control, and uh, a capillary flow experiment for fluid dynamics experiments. Those are really hands-on experiments. And I really enjoy working with this actual execution of the experiments in a direct contact with the science uh, scientists on, uh, on the ground. Hi, my name is Kaylee Robertson. Uh, my question is for Rick. It has been reported that in 2014, a 3D printer will be sent to the International Space Station. What types of projects will the printer be used on, and what are the challenges of building and implementing a, a zero-gravity 3D printer? Yeah, that's a great question. Now, I've read articles about how the 3D printer is coming up, and I've heard about it back at uh, the Johnson Space Center. We haven't been involved in the uh, printer development in any way, but I'm sure that uh, it's uh, had some challenges due to be, you know, just because we're in a zero-G environment. How it will be used, uh, I'm sure in the beginning it will be more just kind of a test thing where we'll, we'll maybe we'll make some small pieces and see how they work out. But I could see this uh, being a very, very useful thing in the future as we move on beyond low Earth orbit. When we don't have cargo ships coming up every few weeks and the ground uh, can't send us spare parts on a regular basis. You know, when we're up here, we're on our own. We have all the tools necessary. We have a lot of spare parts. But there's times where we just run out of spare parts. We just don't have the right parts. So I think a 3D printer is going to prove very useful up here in the International Space Station, but even more useful as we go on to the moon, to asteroids, or even onto Mars. Mike, how much is having a 3D printer expected to expedite design, experimentation, and research happening on the space station? 
Yeah, you know, just to kind of follow with uh, with Rick's comment there, I, I think, um, first of all, we just need to, to figure out if it'll even work up here. Um, and then how will it help with uh, experiments and, and execution and, and things of that nature? I think a lot of it, uh, we're going to be dependent upon the ground because a lot of that design work that you're talking about to actually execute, uh, I think our ground teams will most likely be doing a lot of that kind of activity. And, and then we'll just do the execution part, if you will, the actual printing out of the part and then the, the utilization of it and so I, I think it'll certainly help out uh, but uh, again I think first we need to just figure out that it'll work up here hi my name is John Morris uh, this question is for Koichi uh, what is the process of getting ready for a spacewalk both physical and psychological Yeah, as a support crew member to, uh, for a spacewalk uh, that Mike and uh, Rick conducted in December, it was a very challenging experience for me uh, as I needed to make sure that uh, I can send out those guys to the outer space safely and have them come back to the airlock safely. So uh, I had to uh, go back to the basics, uh, just to think through before you take actions and follow the procedure precisely and efficiently. And this is, this is what I force myself to do as a support crew member of a spacewalk. So Rick, in 2016, the Cold Atom Lab will be installed on the ISS. What is the overarching goal of the Cold Atom Lab, and why is it being installed on the ISS as opposed to an earthbound facility? Well, that's a great question. I, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the uh, with the cold atom lab or that experiment or that research, but it's good news to hear. I, I enjoy uh, hearing that the fact that we're going to get new experiments and new research com coming up here at the International Space Station. One of the things we find is that there's all kinds of opportunities up here. The space station is an incredible place, can support just about any type of research or experiment going on. And we are involved in many different things right now, but it's always good to hear that there's more experiments coming up here because we always have room for more. For Mike, NASA is testing a new way to transfer fuel by space robots called the Remote Robotic Oxidizer Transfer Test. The fuel is used in, used in space is extremely corrosive, but if the testing is successful, what could it mean for technology in space and exploration? Yeah, so again, that's another one of these, uh, these new experiments that um, is going to be coming up here, I guess, later on. And, and so it, just like what Rick said, that's, that's very exciting because it's good to see those kind of uh, activities happening. And, and this one in particular, I think uh, it's going to be very useful for as we go beyond low Earth orbit and we start to do uh, deeper uh, exploration into the solar system, whether it be to the moon or asteroids or Mars. Uh, so I, I think those are critical technologies that, that need to be demonstrated. And I think it's uh, going to be very exciting to see those results. Mr. Koichi, how do you feel about becoming the first Japanese commander of the space station? It is a great honor for me to serve as an ISS commander, and uh, uh, it, is a, it is a challenge. And, uh, but I'm humbled to take up this challenge. And uh, having this responsibility uh, is a welcome challenge for me to serve my duties on board the space station while keeping in mind the best interests of safe and efficient operation of the space station. It's really great to be part of the wonderful team. And Rick, what role might the ISS play in the United States plan to possibly return to the moon and then move on to Mars? Could you repeat the question, please? What role might the ISS play in the United States plan to possibly return to the moon and then move to Mars? Oh, well, yeah, the ISS is a big part of that. It's like the first step uh, in returning to uh, going to beyond low Earth orbit, returning to the moon or going to Mars. Uh, you know, we're developing a lot of the technologies. We're developing a lot of the procedures right here. We could test out new ideas up here. We're learning how to uh, recycle water, recycle air. We're learning all the things that it's going to take to go beyond low Earth orbit. So all the things that we are doing here are, are the first step and a big part of moving on beyond low Earth orbit, going to the moon and asteroids and Mars and other things like that. Mike, can you tell us about your college experience? 
Well, it seems like a very long time ago. Uh, yeah, it was a, it was a wonderful experience, um, and it's a big part of, of why I had the opportunity to be with NASA and to be up here today and working with uh, such a great team. Um, you know, I, when I went to college at the University of Illinois and then on to Stanford in aerospace engineering, I, I had no idea that I was going to get this opportunity. It was certainly something I dreamed about, but uh, at the same time, it was something I, I just had a, had a great time with uh, studying there. I had the opportunity to play football in college. Uh, I was part of the ROTC program and the Pi Cap Alpha fraternity. So the college experience uh, was, was just absolutely fantastic. And best of all, that's where I met my wife. Koichi, what is the training process like to prepare for a mission to the space station? Yeah, uh, the training flow is uh, for about two and a half years after assigned to a space flight on board the space station. We have training in Houston, in Moscow, uh, Cologne, Germany, Montreal, Canada, and in Scuba in Japan. It's a very extensive training. And uh, we learn about the space systems operation, experiments, payloads, spacewalks, robotics operation, etc. And it is very exciting to learn from the experts of the subject matter in uh, different countries. Rick, besides friends and family, what is one thing you miss from Earth? Now that's easy, uh, food. <laughs> you know, all our favorite foods. We had a wide selection of food up here, and it's actually pretty good. But uh, obviously our favorite foods, uh, you know, it's been a while since we've had them, and we, I look forward to having them again once I land here in a couple of months. Can you describe the experience of your first launch into space? Yeah, it was, uh, it was a bit surreal. Uh, you spend, as Koichi talked about, you spend two and a half years preparing for that moment. And, and at some point, you, you kind of wonder if it's ever really going to happen. And you don't really believe it's going to happen until you actually start to lift off because you, you just think, oh, man, you might get hurt, you might get sick, uh, or something else could happen that would, that would pull you out of that. So first of all, there's, there's a bit of a sense of relief that, hey, I'm, I'm actually launching. Um, at the same time, there's this uh, jumble of emotions that are going through you. you know, there's for me, it was my first launch, so you're very nervous, you're very excited, uh, but you're also very focused because you do have, you've trained a long time for this, you know the procedure, so you're just basically walking through the checklist and, and making sure everything's performing the way, uh, the way it's supposed to, and really the training kicks in at that point, and it's, it's a great ride. Kochi, what is the best piece of advice you've received? <laughs> okay, uh, from my uh, previous uh, crew commanders of my uh, previous space missions, I uh, learned that uh, keeping uh, good the communication with the, the ground team is a key to a successful mission. Space station is such a complicated technological uh, uh, asset, and uh, we have uh, outstanding ground support team in the different control centers throughout the world. And uh, we greatly uh, depend on the success uh, uh, on, on the mission control center. So uh, keeping good communication is really a key. That's what I learned. And for Mike, final question. The sun rises and sets every 90 minutes. What's it like to see that? And how do you get some shut eye? Uh, I'm sorry, we didn't catch the question. Can you repeat it one more time? The sun sets and rises every 90 minutes. How, it, how does it just experience that, and how do you get some sleep? Okay, yeah, that, that is, it, it's actually pretty neat to, to have that many uh, sunrises and sunsets. Uh, and to be honest, we don't really notice it too much, though, when we're working inside the space station, because we really don't have a lot of windows that are looking out um, on the Earth and, and seeing the, the night and day cycles. And so really, um, in terms of impacting our sleep, it's not too bad. When it's time to go to bed, we simply just turn off the lights, and as far as we know, it's, it's nighttime, just like down on Earth. Uh, but getting to see that many sunrises and sunsets, in fact, when the, when the sun rises, you, you start out out with just this this little uh, line of, of blue on the horizon or, or the limb of the earth and then you, you get a little bit of orange and then this brilliant sun just uh, just blinds you and and getting to see that uh, 16 times a day is fantastic 
All right, thank you very much. We want to thank Mike, Rick, and Koichi for talking with us today. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. And joining us now back here on Earth is Dr. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you.